Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to our talk this evening. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much to Mark's Club uh, for hosting us. My name is Simon Crompton. Uh, I'm a author and writer and the founder of the website PermanentStyle.com. I have with me here this evening uh, two wonderful speakers, Gianluca Milirotti from Pamela Trousers um, and Douglas Cordeaux from Fox Brothers. And this evening we are going to have a hopefully quite a conversational talk about craft brands, um, ones we've worked with, ones we've known over the last few years, and kind of where we see a lot of the industry going. And I think one of the reasons we thought this would be an interesting subject for discussion was the fact that all three of us come from quite different backgrounds and have come to this world from quite different routes. And I think that often maybe gives us slightly different uh, observations or thoughts on how this works. And certainly none of us came from a craft background. We're not artisans, we're not makers, we have no one like that in the family. So I think that brings an interesting perspective to it. We're going to talk for around 30, 40 minutes, and then um, we're going to leave about 10 or 15 minutes for questions at the end. So if you do have a question, then please do ask us. That would be great. Afterwards, we might go to the bar and have some drinks. Um, but feel free to, to leave if you want. Um, we'll just be hanging around there for about half an hour afterwards as well. So please join us for more discussion, hopefully, on the topic. So maybe, I'm not sure everyone necessarily knows about all our speakers. So let's kick off with a little bit of background. Maybe, Jang Luca, could you start by telling us a little bit about your background and how you came into this world? Sure. I'm a filmmaker. I come from Naples, where I grew up until I was 14. And then uh, I started in, in the States filmmaking. And uh, when uh, living uh, far from Naples and knowing everything everyone knows about Naples and suffering a little bit about that, I decided to make this film about tailoring because uh, that's uh, something that I, it was in the family, the passion of, about tailoring. You know, uh, I grew up going to the tailor with my father just as a guest yeah. until 18. And then finally, you know, accomplishing my first suit. So I decided to make this film called Omast about uh, the Neapolitan the uh, theater tradition, which was uh, kind of popular, it seems. Mm -hmm. So went uh, around the world. And, uh, and did you make other films before that? Or, oh, yeah, or yeah, since yeah, yeah. No, So what, what other kind film. of things did you make as well? I made films about uh, designers, uh, about uh, artists, about boxing. Okay. I made films after that about uh, car designers, anything that I'm interested in. Okay. So this was my homage to my hometown and to one of my passion. Because uh, knowing and respecting a lot of the tradition of uh, Cyber Row, for instance, but I also knew that uh, Naples cannot really tell its own story. So, and the tailors in Naples were not very good in that. Hmm. So I decided to give this homage after the Gomorra movie. Because Gomorra, I think, as a movie, is a masterpiece but it's not the Naples that I knew. So I wanted to tell my story about Naples. Mm -hmm. So I did this documentary, which is a very small thing. It's not Gomorra, it's not a huge thing. A huge thing. But, but you know, at the end of the day, I mean, it's a uh, touch, you know, the, the, the sensitivity of a lot of people. So, you know. And what, it's interesting that you say that Neapolitan tailors couldn't tell their own story, because I think often, particularly British tailors or other people, people in Britain would say the great thing about the Italians is they're so great at telling that story and selling themselves. And the is that a Neapolitan thing particularly, or is it just you think they do it but not in the right way? or I kind of disagree on, that, on, on what you're saying about that, yeah, the Italians that they can actually sell themselves very well. Maybe they're good in talking and telling you a story, a single story, but uh, we always talk about wine about this, okay? Like, uh, you know, the French and the Italian wines, you know, the big battle and stuff. We have like 140 different uh, uh, original vineyards in Italy. They have like a probably 20, but in the market, there are more interesting and prominent than us, probably, mm. because we say, we claim that, that they are very good in selling themselves. What, something that we <laughs> cannot do. So, okay? it's all, it's <laughs> so okay. you know, so th I, think, I think that uh, uh, for Neapolitan theatering, it's, a, it's another thing. It's just that uh, they were not very uh, self-confident, I think. Mm. They thought, uh, yeah, we can do what we can do, but uh, we we're pretty humble in that. And, uh, you know, and I don't know, they were not, just not very good. Mm. So I think that Seven Row did a, a great job you know, talking about it, uh, itself and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, promoting, but also celebrating, you know, I mean, with reasons, I mean, with a, with a mm. you know. So yeah, I decided to do it for them. So <laughs> it's not a commercial film, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. And you didn't have any, there's no one in your family that was a craftsman or in any way involved no. in tailoring, it was just, no, your father was a customer? Lawyer, okay. uh, no, no, nothing. 
It's just that uh, my father, he claims that since when he was 13, because of his body, he didn't like his body, his body, his proportion was wrong and whatever. So his, my grandfather brought him to a theater and so he started from there. He never had something like a ready to wear, hmm. always bespoke, since when he was 13. And he's, I mean, we're not aristocrats, so it's not that a, uh, uh, a luxury. It was kind of a natural thing to do in Naples, mm. if you want. You know, you could, you could do that, you know. It wasn't like a, uh, something like a very expensive, or, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. More it was natural. It's a different day thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And in Naples, it was like that. And were you always into, were you into clothes as well? Or was that more just, it was a bunch of passions to do with, like also with wine and boxing and cars and all those other you kind know, of subjects? I always had uh, an interest, since okay. when I was like a, very young, like a seven, eight. <laughs> Always had this sensitivity about clothing. I think clothing is a language and uh, it's pretty interesting to explore. Mm -hmm. So it's not a, just tailoring. Then eventually when you grow up and you understand quality, quality is, uh, it makes a lot of sense with, uh, with the language. Yeah. So, you know, naturally you evolve and you uh, end up in tailoring. Mm. These are the two things, you know. And also, you know, to, the possibility to customize, to interpret, to personalize, I think. So, An know, expressive outlet for how you can do that and get involved in the It's the language. It's yeah. the language. It's like anything, uh, anything else. Mm. Like uh, Bruce Boyer used to mm. say that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. That, uh, you know, clothing is always, he's never shut up, you know, never, he's always talking, he's always speaking loud. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. much. Douglas, can we turn to you? Give us a, a, a potted history. Um, actually, I've always been in textiles since I was probably... 15, actually. I grew up in a, a very violent West Country town, and I was very keen to get out of it. <laughs> yeah. um, but I studied uh, Chelsea School of Art. I went down a very traditional art school uh, training in textiles, but I studied printed textiles. Print, um, mm, okay. I actually started as a screen printer <laughs> in London Bridge, and I used to print for a brand called Body Map. Okay. Um, so many, many years ago, that was my, my first what, job. What were, they, what were they making? Was it upholstery or was it...? No, no, very contemporary fashion oh, wow. brand, yeah. Okay. And actually we did a lot of tie fabrics as well. That's why I have a huge love for printing, printing of ties. Um, mm. There was a big company in Crayford called David Evans, mm. who's now being bought up by Adam Lee. Yeah. And so, yeah, I had a, a big passion for ties, big pattern for, uh, passion for pattern. And, yeah, so always been involved in textiles. I worked for a denim company for many years, Pepe Jeans, for probably 27 years on and off, wow. various different but kinds was that, What was the role there? Was that just fabric design or was it design in general? It or? was uh, menswear design, sourcing denim, washing denim, so okay. kind of very much involved with cloth again, but instead of trying to make it beautiful like I do now, I, I spent most of my time destroying it and <laughs> smashing it with bits of rock and things. So, yeah, very, di very different kind of uh, um, business. But it was there, actually, that I was at Pepe and uh, they were looking to expand and they were looking at buying a brand and Pepe ended up buying Hackett. And I actually went... Uh, Got on with Jeremy very well. Jeremy, I don't know if you know Jeremy Hackett, uh, it, just incredible knowledge on menswear, very, very engaging. And uh, at that time, I was looking to get out of Pepe because they were selling, whatever. And I had a conversation with Jeremy. It was at the Design Museum. And I said, I'm, I'm looking around for a brand, actually, uh, an English brand, very English. And it was at the time when kind of everybody had gone offshore, that everybody was making things. Okay. In, in other, you know, in other parts of the world, and it seemed like we had lost a lot of manufacturing. It seemed like it hadn't, you know, it, it wasn't going to come back. And I was talking to Jeremy, and he said, "What about this? Um, there's, a, there's a mill down in Somerset called Fox Brothers. It's got a great name." I said, it "Sounds great, fantastic." <laughs> Stab established in 1772. I said, this is incredible. And actually, I grew up literally 25 miles away from it, and I'd never heard of it. So some good uh, education in my art school going on. And I, I remember the last words that, that Jeremy said to me. He said, go and have a look at it, but whatever you do, don't buy it. Don't buy the <laughs> mill. You know, it's, it's a nightmare. <laughs> so three weeks later, we bought the mill. Um, <laughs> and with my business partner, my business partner is Deborah Meaden from the Dragon's Den, but my relationship with her is nothing to do with Dragon's Den. I've known her from when she was... Uh, Bingo calling, she won't mind me that, in, uh, in, 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 in Minehead. So we, we <laughs> kind of grew up together. I said to Deborah, come and have a look at this, this place, you won't believe it. And at this stage, you know, we went in and you could hear the sound of looms, the sound of making stuff. And I was kind of, 
This is incredible. This is absolutely incredible. So we both both fell in love with it. The the chap who owned it at that time was slightly on the dodgy side. So we ended up owning it all in 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 a matter of six months. <laughs> so the first two years were absolutely horrific. You know, I didn't set out to be a manufacturer, and that's essentially what I'm doing. Is did you have much? You didn't have you some awareness <coughs> of what the manufacturing side was going to be like, but you didn't quite understand how hard it's going to be just running I a business like that. No, because it's, it's, it's so hard. I mean, it's, it's so hard what we do now, but I understand what we do. But at the time, um, you know, it was, I, I was just kind of like very much in the deep end. I think actually Andrew and Guy were one of the, the, the first visitors. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as I was saying earlier, I had a, we started doing textile shows and, you know, at this stage, it was still kind of, well, how, how are we going to get this to work? And it's, it's very important to have a business that, you know, makes a profit. You know, it's all very good, you know, having something that doesn't. And we weren't by any stretch of the imagination. We were, we were losing a lot of money. And actually, it was when I, I showed at Milan Utica for the first time. It's a big show in Milan. And it was Antonio de Mateus Toto from Keaton that came onto the stand. And I was kind of like, who, you know, who are these people at this stage? <laughs> And he said to me, he said, do you know what? He said, you've got the Rolls Royce of Mills. And actually then I thought, do you know what? That's it. This is my marketing. That's, that's, that's it. And from, ev from that day on, it kind of changed my perception of whatever people thought of us looking in because they yeah. didn't see the, the struggles we were having with manufacturing. So, yeah. And you just saw the reputation and the tradition yeah. more. And then that was so that and you realised how then to sell that to yeah. them. And then you know, I kind of looked also at the... You know, we're going back to how the Italians, they're very good at marketing themselves, especially when they're textile mills. <laughs> so yeah, we always think they're good at marketing. Yeah. It's good. Textile mills, they're pretty good. Laura Piana, yeah. Zenia, not bad. Um, and VBC, you know, they're all good at marketing themselves. And actually, in the UK, textile mills are not good at marketing themselves. And I will tell them that to their faces because, you know, it's, it seems quite a dour business. Mm. And, you is know... It, is, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Is that some of that... I kind of feel that a lot of what you do is quite now customer facing and you're communicating directly to the end customer of tailoring, for example, whereas actually where they've grown up, it's all business to business. There's yeah. no sense that they are selling retail to the customer. So it's a very different kind of thing. It's all about relationships, yeah. about do you know so and so and you know his father knew who or whatever. It's this different dynamic. Yeah, and I, I love the customer facing because we all we're all pretty much the same. We're all into the same things, you know, we like menswear, we like bespoke, you know, we get onto it, we like watches, we have, you know, we have a conversation about stuff, because men generally are into stuff, aren't we? And <laughs> we like talking about stuff. And, and it's, for me, it's easy, you know, it's a great, I have a great product. I actually have someone else running the, the, the horrible bit of it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, you know, I love it. And that's, that's, that's the main thing. I really love what, you know, what we do. It's, it's, um, now it's a, it's, it's a relatively, I'll say that touch wood, it's a relatively easy thing. And, you know, we're talking about social media, that, mm. you know, social media has totally changed our business. Mm. But maybe just before we get on to social media side, so generally could complete your story and how you got involved with more menswear brands and then with Pomela eventually as well. And then we'll start talking about themes more kind of generally. Well, <clears throat> the first approach actually was with Omast that I was approached by Marcho that uh, saw the, the trailer of Omas uh, online, and so he wanted to meet, and uh, he asked me to uh, distribute the DVD exclusively with the Armory. I thought it was a weird idea, very weird idea, but I said, well, why not, you know? <laughs> you know? I mean, why do you think it was a weird idea? Because no one's gonna buy I, it. I'm, kind of, I'm coming from a very different background, you know? Why a guy that owns a shop in Hong Kong wants to distribute this documentary, you know, the DVD, I said, yeah, yeah, do whatever you want. I mean, it's okay. <laughs> I don't think he's going to sell anything. I mean, he sold, I mean, some. <laughs> and from then on, we did the screenings all over the world. And uh, we did uh, another film together, uh, which is uh, I Color di Antonio on Antonio Liberano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A few different projects. Then we, I did some other stuff with uh, BBC, uh, the, the Mill, you know, that you might know. And, uh, and everyone was pushing me, like, because uh, I'm very passionate about uh, clothing and everything. And, uh, so they were uh, telling me, so you're involved in the business? I said, no, I'm just filming it. No, but why? I mean, you, you should, you should, you should. So why do they just, think that, why do they want you to get in full? Just they, they thought, thought you, it was you, natural. It was, they, mm. they thought it was natural because uh, I, knew, I was analyzing pretty much the market, like a, not in a bad way, you know, like I was pretty good at that. 
And I was, uh, you know, giving some advice to people for free, <laughs> <laughs> which is not very wise. And um, nothing at the end of the day, I decided, okay, maybe it's, it's, it's about time. Especially, I thought that there were too many people at that moment in the business, from Italy, I would say. Mm. They were actually approaching the business in an improper way. Uh, since I'm very passionate about this, I wanted the business to be uh, kind of, uh, not safe, but um, clean, in a sense, you know? I want people to be more honest, like uh, ethically. So they're approaching know. it in a proper way in terms of just misrepresenting what they were selling? Well, you know... You don't have to name <laughs> names, but you no, know, what but kind, I mean, of, you, you what be, kind I, of thing? I think that uh, tailoring is about, it's about contents more than the, the, you know, just the facade, okay? Mm -hmm. So the contents means uh, the quality of the thing, the quality of the work, mm. the quality of the cloth, and all the stuff. If you start making stuff that are, are machine-made, mm. tailing that are handmade, uh, making like a so and so, and uh, you know, offering services that are you know, kind of a sloppy, and uh, selling a fabric that is another fabric that is just a blue, it's just navy, it's okay, nobody will understand. Then you know, you you, you kind of uh, feel like uh, you know, embarrassed, and also I feel like, well, you know, I could do better than this. So <laughs> let's what? try to find the, the good ones, and, uh, and you know, let's do this. You know. And what what other ways did you feel you could do it better apart? I'm not I guess there's the storytelling part of it, which comes from what we were just talking about with their master as well, which mm -hmm. they weren't doing very well. Mm -hmm. What kind of things do you feel you could do that they weren't really doing very well, well at that point? I think to make this, this thing a little more contemporary for the Italians. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the Italian point of view. So the service, for instance, mm -hmm. which is very important, which I think that uh, uh, enables at least uh, it's still like a lacking a little bit. You know? mm -hmm. Service, it's, uh, it's a big part of tailoring, I think, at the moment. So it's not that uh, you are good at making a garment, then uh, it's good. It's not. It's not enough, and uh, although I mean, also th this is a, an expensive thing that I mean, a habit that a lot of people has, a passion or whatever. So you have to give something back. You, you have know? to have a, a luxury service to go with a luxury, a luxury product. Yeah, I mean, and I think that uh, the British are much better than the Italians. You know, they, they mm. well, you know, they've been uh, they're coming from yeah. very far back. You know, and uh, also the trunk shows are not an Italian invention. You know, like uh, yeah, we are, yeah. we are learning from you guys. So you know. Uh, service, I think, it's, it's the, uh, is the key at the moment. You have to have a good product, you have to have a little bit of creativity, mm. and the service, it's, uh, it's very important. You have to be uh, you know, uh, reliable to you know? that, that must be a, a particularly big change with the mill. Again, like you said, not being used to customer facing at all. The idea of doing customer service, like you now sell other products and you have a website and you're doing mm. this kind of stuff all the time. It's very, very different to dealing with the tailors and agents model and things that existed before, Yeah, and I, I, think, I think it all comes back from you know, the fact that the mill is, we, we see it more as a brand. Yeah. So, you know, it's very much, you know, we fall in love with things that we, we find along the way. So it just seems natural to, to sell those, those, those products mm. as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's, that's the, you know, the part of the brand side of things is to be able to communicate that. And that's the trade-off because, as I say, manufacturing is, is really tough. But the trade-off, you know, if you scratch beneath the surface of Fox Brothers, then you'll see a whole bunch of people weaving cloth. You know, they're, they're, they're very much hands-on. What we do is is made in Wellington. It's made in Somerset. It's been made there for 250 years, and that's the, the story that you know that we like to communicate. <coughs> and it's, it's a nice story. If you have, if you, if you need to add, say, the marketing element to it and the service element to it as well, is it? Do you generally kind of just hire new people with that kind of experience to work in it, or are you working with local people? as it were to encourage them to do that. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I think actually our biggest, <laughs> the biggest learning curve I had was going to Japan. Okay. And the first meeting I went in, my agent took me in, a very wonderful gentleman called Sam Segure took me into a uh, meeting with, I forget who it was, Takioka. And I went into this meeting and this man just started shouting at me, screaming at me, banging his fists, <laughs> just, just going absolutely mad. And I was standing there just thinking, okay, this is just quite unusual. And uh, <laughs> so I went outside and I said to Sam, what was all that about? He said, well, you know, your, your delivery record is just horrific. <laughs> and you've got five more of those today. <laughs> and so I went to the next one and the same thing happened. And it was coming in the day, I was kind of exhausted. <laughs> I've never met you, but you're going to shout at me for 20 minutes. <coughs> and, um, but we learned from that that you know, the Japanese way, you have to communicate. And if, if you do it their way, it's, it's fantastic. You know, 
it, it's the communication, you know, communicating negatives as well is really, really important. You know, what we do, as I say, it's hard. So it's very important to let them know how you're, if you're running late or there's a yarn issue. or something. And that's, yeah. that's where we've, we put that model in now and it, for the whole of Europe. And that's, that seems to have worked because if you provide good service, you naturally, mm. you naturally grow. That's actually a very good point. Even in tailoring, it's the same thing. Mm. And most of the tailors, they don't tell you the truth. What is going on with your suit, with your jacket? What is, if there is something wrong, if they're late or anything? Or especially if they make a mistake, which is very important. So being a customer, first of all, the first thing I do, I accept you know, all the, the, the complaints. I mean, I'm lucky that we don't have many complaints. But anyway, I accept it. I try to analyze. I don't say right away, no, 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 it's not true. No. You have, to, you have to wear it like this. And that. No, it's wrong. That's it. <laughs> you're wearing, you're, you're wearing <laughs> it's it It's our wrong. mistake. It's not I mean, what can I say? Just, you know? yeah. yeah, because you know, usually, <clears throat> I mean, my personal experience, not my data that is here present that actually, so it's been very <laughs> honest to me. But I've seen a lot of crazy stuff in, in, in uh, workshops, you know, like uh, it's always the client faults or the cloth or the weather, anything, you know, anything can happen, you know, the, the, the earthquake, you know. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I think that it's uh, already service when you actually just take it, yeah. you know, okay, I'm sorry, I apologize, and uh, we're yeah. going to fix this, you know. Anything I, goes already... wrong, I remember that first meeting being screamed at and think, right, I'm on the phone, I'm telling you. Because <laughs> <laughs> you just don't want to be screamed at ever again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and have you, it sounds like the, the Japanese market is probably one of the hardest ones from that point of view, in terms of their expectation of that kind of service and that kind of It is, but order. once it's but, running, it's so, so fantastic. They're very loyal. Uh, very loyal to quality, and mm. that that goes to any kind of uh, skills manufacturing. They're they're very loyal. To, they totally get it. They totally get it, and they just kind of want respect through that journey. And mm. they don't want you to hide things. And you know, since we've been delivering well, the orders have been going up. It's it's <laughs> quite simple. Yeah. Um, you know, and you know, yeah, it's it's a, it's a fascinating market. Is the um, I kind of felt like you were saying like the communication is central to bespoke tailoring and. It kind of it, it makes complete sense when you think about it because the, one of the pleasures of bespoke tailoring is knowing your tailor, going to visit your tailor who's known you for a certain amount of time, knows you ordered before, can sort of see your wardrobe, knows the issues you've had, and then you talk about things you might have, and he gives you some information, you give some opinions, and you come to a decision, and that's really nice. But I kind of feel a lot of the tailors just have failed to adapt that for a, a market which is international and digital, basically. They don't really think, okay, I need to try and do that on an international basis now, which means a lot more emailing and contact or that kind of thing they're not kind of used to no they're not used and they don't want to be used that's a, that's a, the, the worst part so some they're trying to be on the international market but honestly they should like hire someone who is a to do it for them. yeah, yeah. it's not working also the the social media they, they don't use it properly you know it's uh, it's very confusing that thing and anyway some they're they're on social media in an improper way that which is not building any market which is not making good uh, for them for anybody, not even for the for the name of Neapolitan tailoring, for instance, you know, it's it's just a little f off. You know, and, because you know. they're not presenting themselves in the right way. They're not talking about the right kind of things. Uh, or everyone, what? everyone has his own has his own uh, skill. Yeah. Okay, if you're getting making a, a proper bespoke uh, tailor suit, it doesn't mean that you are a communicator. You know, hmm. it doesn't mean that you are an artist or you are a, a manager. Or, you know, there are other people that can do this. You know, some they are very good. I mean, some they're very good. Mm. Yeah, I mean, in tailoring especially, what I've seen is that uh, it's a very specific kind of field, you know, like if, you, if you're a very good tailor, you might not be a good speaker, you know, not a very social person maybe, you know, so, you know, I mean, people like, like uh, Douglas, for instance, I'm, uh, I'm amazed by his, his skills in communication and uh, social media, yeah, yeah, I think you're doing an incredible job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, I what, what, I mean, what, what specifically do you think Fox is doing really well? I'd say he's so close. I mean, first of all, he has the sense of the market, the people, because he meets all these people. He's mm. all over the place. He meets everyone, and he talks to these people. And he understands them, and also the, the pictures he takes, they are not like a professional pictures, but they're like a nice, interesting pictures. You know, so he he really understands what he, what is like a shooting, what he's uh, experiencing, and people feels that. Mm. That's why Fox. I mean, I talk to uh, Francesco Barberis quite often. Okay, Francesco, which is like a, he has one of the biggest meal in the world, 
he's scared. <laughs> like he looks at him like, huh, what is he doing? Why is he doing that? <laughs> Why? Oh, he was there. Oh, all right, all right. And so it's like a little bit, you know, been preoccupied. And I mean, his size is really big, you know, to be mm. preoccupied, you know, but you know, still. So, you know, I have a lot of respect for a figure like a Douglas. I think in tailoring, we don't have that many figures like that. You know, tailors that can do this, even the young ones, forget about it. Mm. So what, is there a, a structured approach to social media, or how would you describe what you um, do think, and how's it changed? I think it's because, yeah, I, I meet a lot of people. I really enjoy meeting a lot of people. You know, you have conversations. You learn so much by, from the end consumer. We, we sell to big brands, but we don't get that much back. Yeah. Um, they don't use the labels and things like which is which is fine. But with the end consumer, it's fantastic. You have conversations and... So an actual bespoke customer, you mean? Or yeah. Rather than yeah, a so yeah, I, yeah. I usually... You know, I tend to do trunk shows, so I'll go along with the tailor, and mainly because I can stand there when it comes to choosing the cloth, it's kind of like, yeah, thank <laughs> you. But you, you learn so much, you know, just ha their lifestyle, you know, their, mm. how, you know, what they're going to wear, why they're going to wear it, and then you think about, well, you know, we're not doing that, we should be doing that. Mm. So we had a conversation probably about five years ago about social media, and, you know, they were like, mm, no, it's, you know, we make good cloth, it's fine. Yeah. But how do, how do people know that? You know, <coughs> how do they, you know, and the trade, you know, it's it's on my doorstep. You know, we, we have it around us every day, so it's quite easy to yeah. to take a photograph of something that you love and you, you're making by hand. So you know, it's really it's and it, you can just get it out there. Mm. You know, it's it's I find it very very fascinating and incredibly, it's free. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's you know it, you know but we yeah. used to pay money on. A PR. Yeah. yeah. But now... Absolutely. And that's the thing that kills me is that I think a lot of artisans, like, social media just could be amazing for them. Like, you can basically... So many people are using, say, Instagram to do everything, to see what you do. You ba so your, home, your profile is basically a website, and you can create that by just creating 30 or 40 images of nice tailoring and putting it up there. Mm. That's very easy and quick and free. And then all you have to do is create, you know, a, a new image every now and again, and anyone who follows you can. It just kind of gets sent out there. It's like, you know, it's a free email campaign. You have to yeah. pay people to do these kind of email campaigns for them and they can just do it up in there for free. And yet a lot of them just don't seem to get it right. Either they post a lot of pictures that are just of like what pasta they had for dinner, which I just don't care about. You know, or they're like, you're trying to sell like a four thousand euro suit and every picture you take of your suits just looks awful. You know, it's not that hard. You know, you could get hire a photographer a couple of hours he could provide you content for six months of all the stuff around. You know? Although I think that, uh, that uh, it's not just about the quality of the image. Mm. Because again, it's about content. So it's not just how beautiful is the picture. Sometimes the be there are beautiful pictures about, a, I don't know, whatever, Brioni jacket that is not very interesting. The, the picture is beautiful, but then it, eh, whatever, you skip it. That's mm. it. You know, so it's, I think that the experience is more interesting. So mm. what it does, for instance, it's very interesting. Is, uh, you get the sense of what is going on. And uh, one thing that I think I, I know for sure, because we did a trunk show together, we did some stuff together, is that uh, we have in common that we have fun doing this. Yeah. Like uh, even the relation at the trunk show with the customer, it's not as terrible, like, uh, yeah. you know, merely selling stuff, you know. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, it's fun. We talk to the guy, we want to understand what is his lifestyle, I want to imagine some stuff, you know. I want to get into that because I want the guy to be happy, mm. you know. Uh, that's what I want for me. And I want, I think that the, one of the biggest satisfactions is to see a satisfied customer that uh, really is into what, what we made for him, you mm. know what I'm saying? And it's not just like a, I want a gray suit, and that's it, you know. And, and that's, that's the difference between, like, yeah. You know what I mean? I do. I and mean, it's the difference between, like, a, say, like a traditional Savaro tailor who just makes and doesn't care anything about, never sees the end customer, and often, like, a, say, a salesman in front of house who's maybe in a bigger house, a little bit driven by numbers, for example, mm -hmm. and actually someone like the pair of you who actually really, really care about the product and have come from different areas but have kind of got into this and love Karen doing it mm -hmm. because you love the product so much. Yeah. And that must be so much such an enjoyable sales position to have if you just enjoy selling it all the time and you feel yeah, it's great. Lovely. Yeah, 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 it's really, I mean, doing it. recently I've done, you know, did a trunk show in Germany and the guy was like, well, do you know what? Your cloth is so beautiful. I'm going to go, I'm going to take, I'm taking you home. I'm going to bake you the best schnitzel <laughs> you've ever had. <laughs> wow, let's do it. <laughs> and, and he did, it was fantastic. Because he really cares about schnitzel yeah. that much. Yeah. He said, I want to give you something back. And, yeah, you know, yeah. it was great. And, you know, you, it's, it is that six degrees, you know, the separation, yeah, you have yeah. the same interest and yeah. then, 
you know, you just start talking about the wine that you're drinking, and yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's great. Yeah. Mm. And it, they, they, they become friends. They're, you know, they're not customers, and yeah, yeah, you know, it's, exactly. it's, it's, it's exactly. amazing. Yeah, it's almost like, like, like that, like, I think the pair of you both more similar to being a customer in some way. There still are customers of lots of other people. Like you're more, in some ways have more, in similar, more similarities with that end customer who really cares about his tailoring and really cares about his cloth because he also really cares about the, that wine or he really cares about where he goes on holiday. And it just not, doesn't, mean like it's, doesn't mean he's some cookie cutter kind of gentleman who has to like sports cars and watches and whiskey and cigars and do all these kind of things. But anything he does care about, he's going to care about it a lot. Yeah. You know? And therefore, there's going to be some of those things that you have kind of have a lot in common. And actually, when I set off and do my trip down Italy, I'm thinking, oh, my God, how many suits have I got to pick up? Oh, because you go in <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, 20 minutes you're having conversation, selling the cloth, then the measure's out. They say, yeah. OK, that's fine. I'll have a suit. And think, oh, I've got to go back and pay for that. <laughs> so are you Fox's best customer? Is that what you're telling me? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. But yeah, I do. I like to try out all the customers as well. So, uh, yeah. And what it's on that point on social media? Can you describe like what the approach? Because you don't do it all yourself now, do you? Have other people? Um, I doing don't it? do. We have uh, we have two accounts, but just about to do another account. But um, we have a Fox Brothers account, uh, which my two designers do. Uh, they're both ladies, and we like the fact that they they add much more of a feminine side to the to the business which is very masculine mm. and they look at it in a quite a technical way as well and then I have my own social media site where I can sort of talk about you know more of the tailors that I'm kind of interested yeah, in yeah, or yeah, the okay. you know because I've just posted something recently we did with Nike about five years ago and well at the time I was like well, why am I doing this with Nike this is a bit weird <laughs> you know should I be telling people and actually, I posted it the other day, and people were like, where, where are these bloody trainers? Where, where can you get these trainers? <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it's, it's good for doing all of that sort of thing as well. And yeah, we, and we like collaborating. We like um, collaborating with like-minded people. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you meet these people, you end up saying, well, is there anything we can do together? And, you know. And yeah. well, so, so it's like and <coughs> those kind of collaborations you've done, but also you've got one coming with Conlargo Bikes, for example, yep. and we're going to do an event at Pity and so on. Like, what's the, the driver behind that? Because you're not presumably expecting to sell a lot of cloth to the cyclists or bikes to the Fox customers or whatever it is, but it's just about experimenting with something in that area that you think you're both really passionate about. Yeah, it's quite a strange one. Um, you know, we're doing a, a kind of development thing with a sports company. It's going to take probably five years, but in that process, I ended up going to see Colnago, the, the bicycle factory in Italy, and I just fell in love with it. It's just incredible. It's in Ernesto Colnago's house. <laughs> it's quite a big house now, but the bikes are essentially made there by hand, and it's the same as tailoring. You know, there's so much love going into it. It's, it's so like-minded. The, the guys are all into, you know, they're into their clothes as well. It's a good way of keeping you trim. So, you know, and I, when I grew up, you know, I was thinking Colnago bikes. It's one of the things I've really, really loved. And, now we have Colnago and a Fox Shield on the same thing. <laughs> it's, you know, as I was saying, you know, I'm really proud to have been able to do that. And, you know, one of their last collaborations with, was with Ferrari. So, you know, it's... Yeah? Yeah. yeah. How do you know that? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, but if you share similar values with, uh, with uh, different brands of, of different fields, mm. I think it works pretty well, you know. Mm. You, know you don't need to sell more in that uh, particular, you know, angle, but... Uh, is it just it's the, not the, the point. The, That's the, not the point. Is the point more that the, the customer sees that you are of the same kind of value and therefore yeah. gets both something else? That's, both that's sides, what right? you're displaying. Mm. You're displaying like a, what you believe in, what you like, what is your taste. Mm. It's like when you become friends with someone, you don't talk about just you know what you did that day or you know you, you speak about anything, mm. experience, life, you know, and your wine or whatever. You yeah. know, because that actually is very. It's incredible to see someone make something with these. You know, usually it's just a pair, you know, it's a pair of hands that make the most incredible things. And, yeah, yeah. You know, it's something to, to really shout about. Mm. Is, yeah. that beca is that becoming less the case with cloth or not? Like, is it can be slightly more automated or is it never really going to be at the scale that you're doing? No, we're much more automated than we used to be. Okay. But that's just to, you, you know, we used to work on very old looms, but now we work on very, very new looms. And that's mainly because of training, because we had looms that were 60 years old and we had looms that were one year old and then okay. trying to get people to train on a 60 year old loom and then 
one that is just totally computer driven. They kind of, how does that work? One you hit with a hammer, <laughs> and one you program. Uh, so we have to get some, <laughs> some are uh, you cannot you're not allowed to use them any, anymore, right? The old ones. Because I remember Automantero was from uh, Carlo Riva. Right. He was telling me that they had oh, problems yeah, the, the, with that. Yeah. Why? The old Jackard ones are very, very... Yeah, yeah because they're, they're illegal now for, yeah. for the old uh, the security they, system because they, and all the stuff. Because they're not secure. Because, I mean, you have the, this people injure themselves. Like, yeah, I mean, there is no control that thing. You know, like, uh, it just suddenly, they just <laughs> jump out and kill someone. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's why it's so expensive. Actually, we had, <laughs> we had uh, one Japanese customer that insisted that we wove their order on the old looms. Okay. And we explained that it's going to be exactly the same. No. Once it's on the old... And they sent someone <laughs> to watch it being woven on the old looms. And it took two months longer. And the repairing was just... Because when the, when the old loom is weaving a cloth, if there's a, if there's a fault or a mistake, it will just carry on weaving away. And unless someone visually spots it, it'll just carry on. Whereas a new loom will just stop and tell you why it stopped and yeah. point you to the to, to, you know all the reasons of that. So <laughs> yeah. then you've got to repair all that by hand. So so we got rid of them for the next order. Now, where are the looms? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, one of the questions I wanted to talk, uh, sort of ask was about it's a hard one, but kind of like the commercial side of running us, the kind of businesses that you were involved with. In that I kind of feel, in contrast to most small companies these days, like your aim is is really sustainability. Like, can we create something here which is going to last, is going to be, can, is going to service people for a long period of time? In your case, it's going to kind of continue that kind of history that you've had. But often it feels like companies are not necessarily that good at managing themselves from that point of view. Either they just say, we'll carry on doing this way, we've done it forever, even if it very, very slowly runs itself into the ground. Or they sort of become very fashion driven very quickly <laughs> and try and become a contemporary brand and just get, to, you know, try and sort of explode overnight and lose that. Is there any kind of advice or lessons you can give from kind of, from that point of view? Nah. Honestly, I mean, it depends why you, you are, uh, you start a business, I, I guess. And also the chances that you have. Like, uh, if you think that your DNA is, uh, it's uh, about quality, I mean, you, get, you, have to, you cannot not stick with that. You know, like, it's something that, uh, you need to, do, like, I learned from, uh, from uh, his master, from Ciro Palermo, that it was, uh, always, he had a lot of offers uh, all, all the time, for, uh, all over his life, to become, like, the master in a big brand, like, at Keaton, or whatever. Yeah. He always refused anything. He said, at the end of the day, I, I, I was born as a tailor, and I want to die as a tailor. I know that I can make, like, a 300, maybe 350 suit per year, garment per year. This is what I want. I will never be a manager. I will never be rich and all stuff like that. But this is it. So the only thing that we can, I can think of that we are already trying to plan is to get always like a quality. It will be like a, the main thing. But uh, to have like a different little brand, like a, the bespoke side is the bespoke side. You have to protect them. But it's, mm -hmm. it's not anything that I invented. Like uh, people in this room that are, are doing it properly already before me. And we do like a you know, some ready to wear with the same quality, but it will be on size. But it's, it's, it's also a matter of uh, chances. Uh, you, not everyone can come to us or we can go to them. Mm. If you live in uh, Indonesia, we don't do trunk show there. I mean, there is no way you're going to get our bespoke trunks. You know? yeah. I mean, uh, unless you come to New York or whatever. So, so yeah, so we do the ready to wear and stuff, but we, we try to stick to that. So, that's, so you're exploring that area yeah. and feel like, you know, it's not going to take over the company, not as if you're kind of licensing your brand to kind of somebody else, but you're just saying, well, there's a customer here that's not quite being served. Let's just explore where that's going to yeah, go. I don't, yeah, but I, I don't have that, that problem at the moment, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you know, it's one of those things. I mean, you are in the market anyway. Yeah. If you feel that you have some power, you know, and some chances to get into a market, mm. of course you want to explore more, but it's more about an exploration and we will see. But uh, I, 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 my, my goal is to keep the sense of quality. So one, the, one of the reasons why I like this field and I like what I'm doing is because I, I can preserve the quality. And people value the quality, so it's yeah, easier to keep it. Yeah, but also me as a customer. Yeah. I don't find many things around that actually are satisfying for me yeah. as a customer. So that's why I love tailoring. I love uh, certain brands, but not everyone. You know, like a, It's very difficult for me to, to go around and shopping. You know, I, I don't do, I, it's not my thing. You know, mm. It's very, very tough because this, it, it, for what you're seeing, you know, it's a, 
just becoming everything very commercial is very difficult to find like a proper cloth but even if it's machine made it's okay but I mean at least the garment I mean the, the cloth yeah. has to be good quality no mm. it's the margin the problem the margin is the main problem so for me that thing it's a uh, you know doesn't appeal so I want to do my brand in a different way it's not it's, it will never be like a huge one but at least it's gonna be a respected one mm. <laughs> like, you know did you ever have those kind of conversations with folks like in the early years I guess when Maybe it's not doing quite so well, still losing money is the thing, or should we, I don't know, you sell to somebody else, or you let's go in a completely different direction with what we do, or... God, I spent hours in the car park crying. <laughs> 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 what have I done? Yeah. <laughs> no, literally, that's not, that's not even... <laughs> that's not made up. Um, yeah, that, yes, it, it was... Uh, <laughs> yeah, incredible. But I suppose now we're, we're really kind of focused on being contemporary as well and constantly okay. inventing new things because you know we, yeah we did do a lot of stuff with Cary Grant we did loads of stuff with Winston Churchill but you know my audience is hopefully getting younger and you say that to some of them <laughs> they're like who's that you yeah know, um, well, you did with Simon Crompton absolutely <laughs> and it's that you know we're looking at different cloth developments now it's so important actually wool is is really relevant in the you know what's going on in the world at the moment so I also sit on the uh, the the ca for campaign for wool, um, there is no wool in the sea. Um, mm, you know, it mm, instantly it's mm. becoming a much more of a sustainable mm. story as well, um, and it's becoming more of a technical fiber as well, much more of a technical fabric because we've probably been spending twenty years developing stuff which is polar fleece, which is essentially trying to be wool when actually wool is there's no oil. You know, it's it's a natural product, so. That's, that's where we should be go going. And also, you know, I like what we all do is because we're not mass producing, we're not mass buying stuff. We're starting to think about mm. what we're buying. And, course, you, yeah. you, you know, that, that's so important as well. And I think that message is, is getting across as well. Mm. You know, the, 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 the stories that you're, you're telling and how things are made, you know, be people buy into that and say, well, actually, that's, that's mm. a good thing. You know, I'm also supporting those hands that are making it and yeah. the next lot of hands that are coming. So, yeah. you know, when I came into the, you know, you think, oh, it's just expensive. It's not just expensive. It's the right, oh, yeah. it's the right value for, for, for mm. these things. Well, Antonio Rivarano uses it always, uh, that it's an investment tailoring, for instance. Because so you, you make a suit. Okay, it's expensive the very first day, but uh, I have suits, honestly, my, myself, that are like probably 15, 20 years old. Coats, you know. Mm. I mean, I have suits from my father. That I, I mean, not anymore. I, I cannot use it anymore because I changed a little bit my body shape. But, but um, yeah, I mean, we can last long. I mean, La Poel can has uh, suits from his grandfather. Mm. You know, so in these terms, but you have to be also, uh, you know, honest. The market, the big market, is not about this. Yeah. We cannot ex expect everyone to be sustainable like this. No. I mean, and no, it's a big thing to turn around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there are big brands that sell T-shirts for. Four bucks, you know, and uh, there is an entire economy that is uh, around that thing. So you know, we, we're not the solution. No. We just keep our garden clean. You know, in mm -hmm. a sense, you know, that's it. Maybe on the um, like one last question before we open it up to, to everyone else. The the point about fashion I find kind of interesting because you're doing new collections every season, which is much more structured than, for example, what John Luke is doing. It, is there a temptation sometimes just become always to push to be more fashionable, to kind of follow the fashions or say, well, everyone's doing this green or that, that colour or everyone's doing tartans or whatever it might be. And, and just kind of, if you're a traditional brand, on the one hand, I think a lot of, for example, I think some Savile Row tailors suffer with this, that they either do basically what Cary Grant wore or they want to do like Supreme and they don't, it's hard to do something in between. You know, something which is still contemporary, still very kind of aware of what people are wearing, but with that kind of, with a sense of tradition as well. Finding that middle ground can be tricky. Yeah, I think actually what we do is, is we, we hide colour quite well. Mm. So it's, mm. not, it's not too garish, you know, we, we try and hide it as much as possible. And we're very fortunate, we have a, an archive just full of stuff. And actually if you look at an archive book from probably 100 years ago, there's actually more colour oh, yeah. in that That's book crazy. than yeah. there is now. That's and incredible. You know, the reason why we wear blue and grey is because the yarn suppliers make blue and grey. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that's now as we've slowly got bigger, we can now put down bigger lots. So, mm. you know, the greens that we do, the browns that we do, we can now 
afford to, to because dive you have the scale, bigger you can buy yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Whereas before we were dictated by uh, yarn shade cards, but now we can we can do do that and everybody goes, Yeah, I love that. Love that really bright green. Do you know what? I'm gonna go for the grey, but <laughs> you know, it's but it's you know yeah. It's, but yeah, that's how we um we, we try and put as much colour out there where it's acceptable but not brash colour. It's kind yeah. of always quite hidden. Mm. I guess it's nicer when you start doing more tweeds and more browns and greens and yeah. kind of melanges and stuff like yeah. this. More colour you can kind of work in there than yeah. if you're just doing, like, yeah, as you say, grey and maybe flannel a lot. And actually, yeah, do you do the, like the, you know, if you saw our grey flannel as tops before it's all ripped apart and spun, you would be amazed <coughs> of the colour that hmm. are, is in there. You know, there's often four, 15 shades, I think, that goes in our standard uh, grey flannel. And that, if you looked at it, it would be brown, white, ecru, um, a tiny bit of green. Um, and that's why if you look at an English flannel, it's very warm, whereas an Italian flannel is very blue. Mm. So ours tends to be much browner, which mm. polo traditionally kind of like that sort of mm. very dull finish. Mm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, that was great, I think. Well, I enjoyed it anyway. Um, <laughs> do we have any questions from the audience for either of our speakers about craft companies? Yes. Thank you so much, guys. Um, uh, Douglas, can you just go back to when you were talking about sustainability and give us a bit more information on how you've seen that affect your business, whether that's consumer demand or just things that you want to do a little bit different we, uh, by the very nature of our product, we use superfine merino, so that's expensive. So it's it just by the nature of that, then it's a, it's a good quality fibre. But I suppose in the last few years, then we, you know, more and more people are interested in that, um, so we can shout about it. And it's one of those things that you don't, you kind of take for granted. You weave wool. But actually, then you look into its properties and think, well, that's that's incredible. What we do, you know, we weave the fabric, it's spun. But actually, then the sheep farming side of it, that's a whole other side of things that mm. people don't really see. You know, it's, it's um, is it yeah, hard to have context in that kind of thing? Like hard to appreciate the fact that you get it from one, you know, fairly small niche of the industry that's all coming from Australia or whatever yeah. else, a particular merino. And actually, there's this massive industry out there which has far more problems with sustainability or yeah. animal treatment or anything else. You just don't think about that most of the time. Uh, we do, we do. Okay. We, 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 we're very careful where we, we source our yarn from. Um, so, you know, that's um, because that's becoming more and more important as well. I mean, it should, it should always be important, but, mm. you know, it's, it's much more important um, that we look into that as well. Mm. Yes. Uh, do you look into how the colors you're putting to the yarn? As in, are they organically colored? They're all very, very heavily regulated. So you'll often see now that cloth that people say, oh, yeah, I've got this amazing black cloth. That's because it's got some amazing chemicals in it. <laughs> yeah. And we, you're not allowed to put that in. The, that You're not allowed to do that anymore. So you never see that black, black of, you know, like Barathea. So it's changing quite a bit the market, right? I, yeah. I, I, I shot something for Emilio Bucci some time ago, and you know that he was making all this research about colors. It was the pink Bucci and whatever. And they were, they are now all illegal, those, those colors. Yeah. So they, they struggle to make something similar, but sustainable. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, because the, the laws are very strict around yeah, yeah. for this kind of stuff. Because actually there's, uh, if you ever get a chance, Lafayette, uh, Saltier in Paris, they have oh, yeah. this bolt of Barathea that is the most incredible black. And you, until, you, until you see that black, you, you'd never get it again now. So everything now has that kind of gray, gray mm. tinge to it because you just can't dye it illegally. Yeah. Good vintage buying tip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> look, for, look for blacks. Yes, Guy. And you talked a lot about marketing, which I found really interesting. And you said that the Italian mills have got a much better marketing machine and much better reputation uh, worldwide. And the British mills really need to kind of uh, up their game in terms of um, uh, getting better, better known. Do you think there's a, is there more government support for the for the Italian mills to help do that? And how do you think their British mills should sort of I go think, about? Getting I think forward? actually the British mills now are because they're all actually the good thing is all the British mills at the moment are rammed, yeah. and actually the Italian mills are, are slightly down a bit at the moment. Why? But I just think because we're tiny. The, okay. the British mills are really really small and they're really really big. Um, but I think, you know, the British mills now are slowly cottoning on to the, you know, because they make beautiful products and all you need to do is snap it 
mm. and, and show the world, you know, if you love it, I think you've just got to share it. And then will government help you in Italy or more? No, forget about it. No. <laughs> there's, no, there's no help for the government. Actually, it's the opposite. They, they, they try to stop you. <laughs> if you're succeeding, they just want your money, that's it. But uh, no, but I, honestly, I disagree on the marketing thing. I don't think that they do a great marketing. I think that VBC is, is you know, spending some money for their marketing. But if you, uh, you mentioned Zegna, you mentioned uh, Lodiana. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you did. But I mean, the, their marketing is not about the cloud. Their marketing is about the, the ready to wear stuff. So it's another project. They have uh, another co uh, other companies that they make with their cloud, the stuff. But I mean, they are not even linked, like Zegna. Zegna doesn't know anything about the, 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 the Zegna shops. That is the marketing. Then eventually people might buy some Zegna cloud. But uh, honestly, in Taylor House, in Italy, Zegna is not very popular. It's more for factories. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I just, uh, from our experience, it's true, we're only talking about Laura Piano and BBC. So from Anthony Shepherd's experience, those two guys, those two are incredible. We see them three, four times a year. They come and show us things. They come and see Laura Piano. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. opening their marketing. They say we can market cloth. They come and see us in London. They make a big deal. I mean, very rarely, apart from Douglas, very, in the last 20 years, well, 15 years since I've been involved, do we ever see a British mill who comes in and says, what could we do better? What could hmm. we do? We're working on a project with you with Tom. Yeah. We're doing very, very rarely. It might change. I hope so. It's really not common. But this is one side of the marketing. This is like a, like a it's specific. It's, it's, a, it's not, but it's, it's a B2B, right? That's the, the what we yeah, call, yeah. right? But uh, it's not like a, a marketing like a, for, uh, for the customers. Like a, you are a customer of the mill, but not as a customer, as a private customer. Like a, the, the VBC is the only one that actually invests in money on a, on a, a wider thing. Like a Fox yeah. is doing that. It's doing another kind of marketing that is wider. It's for anybody, it's for the consumers, for the, hmm. the, the passionate guy. You know what I'm saying? For the end consumer rather yeah, than just the, the business. Yeah, yeah. 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 not just for the tailors. Not doing either, in my experience, mm. yeah. as well as the Italians. Okay, we're, I'm basically talking about Laura Piano and BBC, so it's like yeah. Yeah. as you said, forget it. Let's all <laughs> say no, it's not, it's not yeah. at all. Yeah. But, and they don't even have a proper rep in London. Yeah. But ultimately, we're talking about the two big ones. Yeah. Who, who eclipsed, Simon might, I mean, he's been too diplomatic as usual, but they eclipsed what are big British mills. Yeah, yeah, you know, that, that for sure. And to the business customer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apart from Douglas, it's true, they're, not, they're just not active. Oh, that, I, that, that I agree. These yeah. Are busy. Mm. That I agree. You also, if you see the service that they do, like a, online, for instance, mm. they have a website, the British ones, but they're like, Mm. I don't know, probably 20 years old or something like that. Like the, the graphic, everything is not appealing. It's not. It doesn't talk to you. Maybe it's misfunctional, it might be. But I mean, they don't do. They, they don't put many efforts, you know, in that. Now probably they're shaking a little bit because, uh, you know, something is going on in the field, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think Little Piano. I mean, I think they're, they're geniuses. Honestly, yeah. I respect them a lot. They did an incredible job for anything they did. VBC is it's trying to do the same, but I, I don't know. It's a hard, I mean, it, may, it must make such a difference. If you're trying to, if it's the marketing, not as Anders saying, to the tailor, but to the end consumer, it makes such a difference if you have a brand because there's almost such money going into the creating that brand. You can just write off the back of the thing. The yeah, exactly. Exciting, yeah. Storytelling, yeah. Know, well, I want to go into my. It helps us. We'd like to sell yeah. British cloth, but we mm. just don't have the assets. Yeah, but uh, how difficult is, I always tell Francesco Barbetti, so you, you're spending the, the money in the wrong way because. Uh, if you present a beautiful picture of a guy driving a beautiful car in a beautiful suit, and you say, Vitale Barberis Canonico, everyone wants to buy that suit, not the cloth. That's mm -hmm. the problem. It's very difficult to display the quality of, that, of the cloth mm -hmm. compared to the, you know, the, yeah. the so it, you know, the, the final customer expect to see a direct uh, message. Mm -hmm. So if uh, you want, you've been talking yeah. about quality, you have to express quality, but not, the lifestyle, that suit is beautiful. Okay, who made this? I want to buy. You know? <laughs> that's that's the reaction. Mm. So yeah. So, so I think that uh, it's very smart from Lorovianna that they actually they did the ready to wear and they did whatever the empire that they built mm. because it I, helps the cloth a lot as well. I think they help yeah. everything. You know, the sense of quality of uh, any kind of uh, level. You know. If uh, another question here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it, you work on retailers or you also do wholesales on this to brands? Um, yeah, I mean, our, our biggest business is wholesale. Yeah. So and do you uh, see any sort of resistance in Italian suppliers working with British cloth that no. they prefer? No, we, we have a certain... That is something that 
We're, we're, we're expensive, not because yes. we want to be. <laughs> they are. <laughs> we're very we're expensive, not because we want to be, because just, you know, what goes into it, we could take ends out, we could make our cloth cheaper, but we don't compromise on anything. So therefore, we have a limited amount of customers. Um, but we find a lot of the fashion houses are actually very, very loyal to uh, quality as well, and actually very fair to deal with. Um, we try and get as many people to visit us so they can understand what we do in terms of, um, you know, everybody in my mill has a name and, you know, they, they work, they're very passionate about what they do and we like our, our wholesale customers particularly to like to see what we do because it changes their point of view as well because they'll just say, 12 weeks delivery, that's, that's just too long. And then they'll come and say, well, oh, actually, I can, I can kind of guess why this is going to take 12 weeks. And then they have started to change their calendar a little bit. So they're working uh, nearer the season for us. So mm. it means that we can buy our yarn, our wool, and, and keep the quality up. And they, they, they can understand that. Once they relate to those hands making it, then it becomes, becomes a partnership rather than, you know, it's a, you know, kind of just a battle about price. You know. So Douglas, um, you're clearly differentiated among your uh, British peers, given vibrant testimony but what is what would you say is one of, if not your only biggest challenge at the moment as a, as a business? And it's okay to say we have more demand than we can supply to. <laughs> um, we're just too we're just too popular. Our quality is just too high, you know. Um, well, I I as I said, I had I had five quite intensive years of being told your delivery the deliveries are rubbish. You're too heavy. You're too expensive. It's kind of like, oh my god. <laughs> what am I doing? And and just and just staying with it. And and actually, the market changed. You know, you came along, people, you know, coming along, sharing opinions. And then we we all sort of bought into that. So I think a lot of it was to do with timing. Initially, really bad timing, and then <laughs> really good timing. So um, yeah. So you know, and you know, we do work with other mills as well, and say, look, why don't you do this? It's kind of quite easy. Um, you know, you've got a phone, you've got an amazing, they've all got amazing product. Um, they've all got the same machinery, they've all got pretty amazing heritage. And actually there's enough out of there for everybody. Um, so, you know, I find, that, I find that quite interesting as well. Yeah. Any more questions for, no? One more. Uh, going back on the commercial uh, sort of side of it that you mentioned a little bit, uh, to both of you, I mean, you struck me as very passionate guys what you're doing and you've been able to sort of turn around the box because you've been super super passionate about going to some clients and, and really diving into it uh, and same for you uh, and you, you talk about this tailor that is happy to make 300 garments a year and that's like that's enough and it's, it's very far away from the, the general tendency uh, we see around in, in the business world today do you perceive it as a sustainable business that you're in or is it just a happy mix of two passionate guys, also riding perhaps a wave of menswear after social media, taking it out on a little bit short. I mean, how are you? So you, there's a question, do you think it is sustainable really yeah. in the long term to carry on doing this? Is it in any way because it happens to be trendy right now or do you think it is sustainable to carry on? You find it trendy? I don't find it trendy. Well, well I think in the lot. To make it sustainable or is there a strong enough commercial side to like- To kind of keep it, it going. When you picked it up and I, mean, I think it's, you ask whether it's trendy. I mean, I think it's most statistics would suggest in the last certainly the last ten years that like permanent style has been going. For example, like heritage has been trendy, make locally has been trendy, tailoring is not as trendy now, but for a while it was kind of tr pretty trendy as well. There are quite a lot of forces that kind of, but it, that made trendy for a while. But I think a lot of those are sort of I think maybe they're dying off now. There, there has always been something like that. I think there will always be something like that, some interest in heritage, some interesting. In qualities, I'm interested in uh, classic stuff, mm. you know. So there is a future for, for, for sure. I mean, I remember when I did a mask, mo much before I did a mask, was like a probably seven years before I did a mask. They were talking about the uh, tailoring business, like a dying stuff. Like nobody goes to the tailor anymore. Ah, come on, it's over, it's over. Everyone will mm. close. Uh, a lot of tailors were quitting and all this stuff. Then suddenly, boom, this thing happened. And now there are stars, and you see Liberani on films, and you see you know, everyone on books and uh, on the Instagram. So, you know, 
You, would you expect that? Would you, uh, uh, you know, uh, preview this thing? I mean, no. I guess the question is if that, if that, if that boom never that. happens again. Does that still kind of sustain the carry on? There is an interest. Yeah. There are people yeah. here that are interested in, in this. I mean, they're uh, fairly young. <laughs> you know, a, there is a future, I think. I mean, as I'm passionate about this, I mean, we thought it was dying. It's still there. It's mm. not anymore. I don't think that the, the wave you're talking about is not that big wave that was like a five years ago, for instance, but it's still there. Mm. So it means that there is a, probably a, a stronger market, stronger in the sense that uh, it's, not, it's not just the fashion, it's not just the trend. It's, it's people that are interested in this, you know? Mm. So I think like uh, people are interested in vintage watches and you know, <laughs> and, uh, anything else, you know? I think that it's not just the fashion, it's something that can be a real market mm -hmm. in a sense. It, it's also up to us, the way we offer and the, 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 the service we give. This can be an habit, it can be, this can be to just keep a it going niche in that way. market, yeah. but you know. It well, yeah, be. I often feel that a lot of the things we talked about this evening, you have a lot of people are probably a huge number of people in the last 10 years have tried bespoke for the first time. Mm. And they will have had some good things out of that and some bad things out of that. If that bad side includes the fact that they had no idea when their product was going to arrive and something was kind of wrong when it actually did arrive and the tailor kind of tried to cover up everything they said and said yeah. it wasn't their fault, then that's going to turn people off. But, there's, but there was an, an opportunity there for yeah. them to actually get into it and realize but what was so wonderful people, about it, right? There are still people trying for the first time. We, we yeah. just met now in Milan, we did a trunk show. With a, with a guy, uh, uh, this uh, guy from Jeddah, it was the first time that uh, he was like uh, putting some money on bespoke stuff. Hmm. He was buying everything off the rack, very expensive stuff. And, and he said, the experience is amazing. I want to, I want to see, I want to do, I want to, you know, hmm. it's more like uh, the human side of, of the thing. That, uh, so this is, this is uh, also service mm -hmm. in a sense. Then maybe in the have a different style than the British, than the Milanese and stuff. Because I've seen, for instance, at Caragini Milan, I've been there a thousand times. I've seen the way they, uh, uh, act with, uh, with their customer. It's a little uh, cold compared to what we do. So it's, it's less fun. Mm. But still, you know, you pick then which one is your tailor. You yeah. pick the tailor, all right? You decide. And you, then your experience will be the one that you want, maybe, you know? Okay. It's, it's a niche market, man. I think mm. that uh, it's, it will never be like the main thing. It, 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 it's not supposed to be. And I think that the meals cannot really survive and it will never point, uh, I mean, it will, it will never uh, think that uh, they can survive because of the tailors. But, uh, mm. I mean, they're working with big brands that are like, uh, they, they cares about quality and they want their quality. So, you know, quality is, is, it will always be around for mm. food, for wine, for yeah. watches, for, for cars. I mean, mm. not everyone accepts like rubbish, you know. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the way we're, we're planning is just to developing new things all the time, looking at um, new, new ways that we use fabric and things because we have to, we want to employ more people. And you know we have to make sure we have a sustainable workforce as well as a sustainable oh. product as well. So we need. Oh, that's that's a very, very good point. In Italy, what is happening is that you don't have the generation of my age, for instance. You don't have tailors that age, but you have younger tailors. You have like a 25, 26 years old tailors that are like a cutters, like a mm. son, Chiro's son that is here, Andrea. Andrea, how old are you? 25 years. He's yeah. a cutter. Uh, okay, he's the son of, the, of this guy, but yeah, the yeah, most yeah. of the son but the of generation the generation between has been mixed they, they are they, they went to school. Okay, it's not nothing bad about going to school, but probably they're uh, unemployed now. You know, mm -hmm. like uh, the most of them, they, the tailors in the tradition of Italy, tailors didn't want kids to be tailors because yeah, yeah. they, they were struggling in life. Yeah. So they wanted them to be lawyers and whatever. So they they lost a generation, probably a couple of generations. They are going back. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of young tailors that are training now. I mean, even my partner is thirty six. It's not like a you know an old man. So, you know, I think that is something that is happening that's very interesting, that they're going back to that. So, there is a future, it's not, a, it's not just the wave. We had one yeah. last question. Um, Christopher Gianluca, how do you think about maintaining that level of quality and that level of service as the business grows and, in particular, as you have to travel more and to more places to acquire customers? My experience with traveling tailors has been, sort of at first, it's, it's great, and then as they get more popular and start traveling, maybe not only to London, but to New York and to Tokyo and wherever else. Yeah. It's led to disappointment on, on a number of occasions and sort of turned me away from traveling tailors. Hmm. That's a good point. I, I, I actually look up to these guys. <laughs> like uh, Anderson and Chevrolet, I think that I did travel since, uh, I don't know, how, how many years you've been traveling? Forever, probably. Well, especially to the States. Yeah, the yeah. Thing. And I think that the service was always like uh, impeccable. So. Maybe we need to learn from this guy, the organization, and uh, you know, and uh, hiring skilled people 
and training people because I cannot be always there. If the business will become so big, at the moment we don't have this problem because I, I'm present and the, 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 the size is still like a, you know, something that I can manage and that Lino can manage. But I mean, you know, I think it's the care you put in this kind of stuff. DBC is a meal. They make 13 millions of meters per year or something like that. The quality is, is good. You know, I mean, they're, they're just very skilled people. They are very, they train properly the people. You know, I think that what, what is happening is that a lot of people, they don't want to train other people. They don't want to, they don't spend time and money on this. Okay, so if you don't have that thing, if you don't want to have like a, a, a guy besides you, you don't want to, what do you call this? Uh, um, like a uh, PA or a, someone well, organized. No, but also a like a, if you cannot like be the guy always present, you have to train someone. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. To represent, to, to be re represent yeah. you, to you, do the same you have thing. to, to yeah. do this uh, at a certain point if your business becomes bigger in yeah. any field. Is like that. Mm. So I think that these theaters that you are mentioning probably they want to do, maybe also because they, they they are a little uh, they, they want to take all the money for them. You know, like, they don't want to invest in this business. I mm. think if you invest in this business, then we have the you know. Uh, theater house that are very respected and, and, and like a strong and a, you know reliable as Anderson and Shepard. I always look up at these guys, like I, 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 because in Italy we don't have something like that, honestly. Mm. Like I, I always complain, also with Rubinacci, for instance, very good, but they are not Anderson and Shepard. They will never be because Anderson and Shepard has a tradition and, a, and a, it's, a, it's it's too, it's it's very reliable on anything they do. You know what I'm saying? So. We need someone like a probably Verano is a, in a very small way, but closer to these guys. That is the only Italian that actually at the moment we can say that you know Caragini never, never travels, so they are reliable, they but in a lot, yeah, you yeah. know. But traveling theaters, huh. we try to make the difference, <laughs> but we are very small. Uh, okay, great questions. Thank you very much. Um, this has been a great uh, discussion for me anyway. Um, really, really fascinating hearing Gianluca's opinions and Douglas's. Um, thank you for coming. We're going to go and have uh, a drink upstairs in the bar. Do join us if you can um, for a quick drink. Um, and thank you very much for everyone for coming. Thank you very much. For more practical information and reviews of artisans, check out permanentstyle.com, the UK's leading website on craft and classic style.